Thank you, Paolo, for this presentation. Before you ask me, the presentation will be all available on our website uh, in a few days. So I'm, I'm, I see you're asking. This is an excellent presentation. Uh, I conclude the first part with Tarek Amitara, which is the Director General of RECRI, who will briefly present the AFEX, the indicator of the RECRI is producing. We are close friends. And then we'll immediately start the next session with our distinguished guests from Egypt. So Tarek, the floor is yours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Forward button. Uh, thank you very much, Roberto, um, and thank you, Mr. Vetturini and uh, the Chairman of uh, the President of uh, Res for Med. We in Recre are very proud with our partnership with Res for Med, uh, especially because we are as a as a southern Mediterranean platform for. Uh, strategic discussion on the future of sustainable energy in the MENA region. Uh, their partnership with this for med has been very enriching to that discussion, especially also in the context of Euromed cooperation on the future of energy uh, or the energy future in the region. Uh, what I thought I would share with you today is uh, a quick panoramic picture uh, in the southern, sort of on the southern Mediterranean context. Uh, especially uh, in relation to the transition towards sustainable energy solutions. Um, but I would like to start by saying that the last two years have been very difficult years for the MENA region. It's no secret what's been happening that is um, overall the political and uh, security climate is putting a lot of pressure on the countries of the Southern Mediterranean to the extent that we see uh, 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 spillover effects, either political, security, or social, uh, negative spillover effects affecting not only the countries, but the, all the neighbors of the region. Despite this uh, gloomy, dark picture that we see in the southern Mediterranean countries, I think on the energy front, uh, there are some very encouraging signals that we can look forward to in terms of uh, deployment of sustainable energy solutions. Our instrument for looking and diagnostic the changes in the last two years are um, two analytical pieces. We call them uh, AFEX, our Future Energy Index, one focusing on renewable energy and one focusing on energy efficiency. And what we try to do with these two analytical pieces is actually to look at the factors that drive the transition towards sustainable energy either within the energy efficiency context or within the renewable energy uh, in terms of uh, policy free frameworks, price conditions, uh, uh, institutional capacity, and uh, finance and investments. Um, so far, what we see that still on the renewable energy targets, the ambitions, the targets are ambitious, but in terms of distance to target, we still have a long way to go. As you can see, that the current installed capacity uh, combined with the current renewable uh, energy project under construction uh, shows still a gap in terms of the ambitious targets that the member states have, uh, or the southern member states have committed to. Uh, overall, uh, if you look at it cumulatively, we still at a very, very small percentage in terms of share of renewable energy in the overall energy mix within the power sector, uh, barely reaching 1% uh, of uh, the total energy mix. Um, so, uh, but hopefully with the current reform and effort that is being taken place, these uh, conditions might have changed. Uh, one fundamental uh, thing that happened in the last two years is actually uh, the efforts that were put on uh, fossil fuel subsidy removal. Uh, we have seen very bold initiatives taking place in some of our member states toward uh, subsidy removal. It was mentioned especially in the case of Egypt, uh, but it's not only Egypt that has done the, the, the homework. We have seen it in Jordan, Tunisia, Morocco and a less successful experiments took place in, in Sudan and Yemen. And of course, the political conditions there are not helping either in that directions. Also, we have seen in the last two years 
a portfolio, uh, a, a diversified portfolio of, of policy uh, measures and policy instruments to bring renewable energy into the grid. Uh, uh, it's diversified in terms of its uh, uh, instruments, either through direct proposal submission, feed-in tariff scheme, net uh, metering scheme, and uh, IPP public competitive biddings. Uh, we have seen them coming up in all countries, uh, probably Morocco, uh, 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 the Algerian feed-in tariff scheme was adopted last year. Still, we're waiting to see a new project coming under the scheme. Of course, uh, Egypt case, we will talk more about it uh, uh, in the next session, but Jordan has actually made tremendous progress in implementing its direct proposal submission. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we have seen, as uh, Paolo mentioned, uh, very uh, 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 impressive prices in terms of the IPP public competitive prices. Um, but it's not only what we don't have to look at the utility scale, but we also need to look at the distributed generation opportunities. And this is to present a tremendous uh, space for the uh, southern Mediterranean countries, especially to look to address also the dimension of the socioeconomic dimension, uh, job creation, etc. So we have seen also a lot of, of uh, several member states moving forward with creating a good environment for a small scale project to come into the grid. Uh, through net metering schemes and uh, support uh, incentives or financing uh, uh, incentives. However, one of the key challenges that, that we have to um, uh, consider uh, um, in, in, in the transition uh, and uh, where we uh, as RECRI very much concerned with is the institutional capacity for acting on the policies and measures that the countries have adopted. What this slide shows you is some side of correlation where uh, by, by looking at the policy frameworks and the institutional capacity, our objective is to get more member states on the uh, uh, farthest quadrant on the uh, right side um, where uh, if the strength of the institutions, uh, of the policies, if the policies are working, but uh, the, the policies are, are, are the right policies, but the institutional frameworks are not in place to move these policies forward, um, so uh, we don't see much change happening. And that is one of the key issues that we want to focus on, at least in terms of our work agendas, uh, the administrative procedures, the, the uh, uh, capacity of, of, of governmental institutions, to actually speed up the process within their countries. So we track these dimensions because we think that this is where we're actually, uh, we say that the nuts and bolts of, of the, uh, that keep the engine moving. So a lot of efforts need to be done on the institutional capacity to speed up the transition towards sustainable energy solutions. Um, at least if we look uh, panoramically on the trends in terms of the developers' markets as a result of these changes, we can see that Jordan and Egypt exhibited sort of a higher diversity of actors moving into this market, which is a very healthy development uh, in terms of uh, the involvement of national and uh, uh, investors and uh, developers into the, the schemes of renewable energy um, uh, with the combination of international players coming into the market. I think this is also a trend we see that is, is uh, putting Egypt and Jordan in a very interesting sort of uh, uh, market development trajectories. So this is a, an overall picture of the situation in the MENA region. I think uh, Egypt is uh, uh, stand sort of in a unique position in, in these changes. And I think we can transit to, uh, to discuss the context in Egypt deeper with uh, our panel for the next session. So I, I'll stop here with uh, sort of the overall panoramic picture. The details are available uh, on our websites to access the both reports. So thank you very much. So with uh, Roberto permission, I'd like to move to the next session, the future of energy mix in Egypt uh, and the role of renewable energy. I'd like to invite to uh, the panel uh, Dr. Mohamed Al Subki um, to join us on the panel. Dr. Mohamed Al Subki is uh, currently the chairman 
uh, of uh, the executive chairman of the new and renewable energy agency in Egypt. Um, Dr. Sobki is also a friend and a, a close collaborator of the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. He has been playing a central and active role in the energy, sustainable energy debate in Egypt from the uh, uh, long, long, I don't, I don't, I don't want to put number of years, <laughs> but uh, just uh, to mention that Dr. Sobki is also a founder of uh, 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 the uh, regulatory agency in Egypt era, and he has been leading also uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, work within the uh, energy research center at the Cairo University, where he has been a, a leading figure in the debate on renewable energy transition within the Egyptian context. Uh, welcome, Dr. Subki. Uh, I would like also to invite to the podium engineer Salma Hussein from the uh, Egypt uh, uh, Regulatory Agency. Uh, engineer uh, Salma Hussein uh, actually been uh, uh, joined ERA from the founding, the first founding days since 2001. Uh, she's a senior technical engineer, currently heading the Department for, licensi for Licensing and uh, Performance Evaluation. She is also involved in the, uh, I don't see Salma, Engineer Salma on the podium, she is coming. While we're waiting for Engineer Salma, uh, who has also been very active, especially in the licensing and the tariff setting for the current feed-in tariff process, um, we would like to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Mohammed Shoaib. Mohammed Shoaib is uh, currently the managing director of Qala Holding, the energy division. Uh, uh, Mr. Mohammed Shoaib is also a leading figure in the Egypt uh, context on, on uh, uh, the petroleum sector, energy uh, development in the in, uh, Egyptian uh, 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 market. Before uh, joining uh, Qala Holding, uh, Mr. Shaib was uh, the uh, uh, head of uh, Egypt Gas, uh, which is the uh, company responsible for the gas uh, development in the uh, Egyptian market. Um, and also uh, currently through Qala Holding, he's active in the development of projects uh, within the energy sector. Dr. Shoaib, welcome to the podium. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> there are many questions that have been put forward in light of the changes, the recent policy changes in the Egyptian context with regard to the promotion of renewable energy. Uh, the feed-in tariff scheme has been introduced. Uh, there has been a lot of work. The first round of bidding has been announced and the results have been uh, also communicated. There have been a lot of efforts to get the administrative procedures working and there have been also uh, many questions on the uh, sort of uh, nitty-gritty of how these projects will uh, reach financial closure and connection to the grid. I, I believe that there will be many questions on these developments and I think Dr. Sobki with his role as head chairman of, uh, uh, of NERIA is in a position to shed lights on the latest developments in the feed-in tariff scheme. So I, without much delay, I open the floor to your excellency to come uh, to the floor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for having me over here. Um, I'll start my presentation as soon as uh, it's on the screen. Uh, but primarily in Egypt, we are facing a number of challenges uh, regarding the security of supply and the sustainability of uh, supply. Uh, the um, Basically, that's uh, the current capacity where renewables is barely presenting 2% uh, of the uh, capacity mix in Egypt. Uh, uh, the government of Egypt is uh, 
looking forward to uh, cover additional needs of, uh, of energy over the next seven years up to year 2022 uh, from different resources. We are not um, phasing out or uh, not amending any of the resources, so we are going to uh, conventional resources as well as uh, renewable energy resources. Uh, the target for our uh, renewable energy uh, resources, as you can see on the left, uh, right side bar, is uh, around 25%, uh, uh, somewhere between actually the 20 and 25%. Uh, Recent studies in Egypt, uh, which uh, uh, study which was called the Combined Renewable Energy Master Plan of Egypt, shows that there is a, a potential uh, target which we can reach uh, in the electricity mix of uh, by year 2050 uh, to exceed the 60 percent of our electricity mix uh, including hydro. Uh, the, 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 the current uh, schemes the Egypt has issued recently a number of legislation in the last quarter of the um, uh, of year 2014. Uh, there is a number of uh, development uh, schemes. Uh, the first one is a competitive bidding scheme, which is primarily uh, carried out by uh, government entities. Uh, that's basically uh, started in the early 90s, and currently we're having 750 megawatts in operation, and we are targeting close to uh, 19 hundred megawatts over the next five years. Uh, that uh, scheme primarily uh, is carried on by the New and Renewable Energy Authority. We produce electricity, sell it to the transmission uh, operator, and then to the end user. Uh, the, the, the payments come from the transmission company to uh, Nuria. Uh, that's based on a subsidized tariff. Uh, end users do not uh, feel uh, the price of the tariffs because uh, all the tariffs are currently subsidized. So these are not correlated. Uh, the, uh, the second scheme uh, basically is uh, the, where the main off-taker, the transmission operator, uh, that has started in 2009 uh, and there is currently uh, two two large type projects. One of them is the 250 megawatt wind power scheme. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 uh, uh, will receive the, um, uh, the bids, uh, the technical and financial bids uh, within the next one or two days. Uh, and there is another 200 megawatt solar uh, project uh, over 10 lots in the southern part of Egypt. Uh, just I slipped my mind uh, to say that currently uh, the the uh, all the renewable energy scheme in Egypt is uh, very much uh, managed by three entities in the country: uh, the uh, feed-in tariff unit at the transmission company, uh, the Egyptian Electricity Regulatory Agency, and the New and Renewable Energy Authority. Uh, the the the, in the BO scheme, uh, the, the, the energy is dealt with in the same way where energy is sold to the transmission company and, uh, and then to the end user. Uh, the transmission company will pay uh, the developer uh, uh, the fair charge uh, based on the competitive bidding and there is a government sovereignty guarantee. Still, the end user in this case is not seeing the real values for the uh, renewable energy. They are not uh, correlated again. Uh, the uh, third scheme, which is the merchant scheme, uh, where there is a direct relation uh, between the service providers and the end users. There is ongoing uh, two projects at two different stages. One is 120 megawatt and another one of uh, 600 megawatt. In this scheme, uh, the energy is passed through the transmission uh, utility and distribution utilities. Again, it's the wheeling charge. The uh, 
uh, the commercial agreement, the financial uh, agreement is a direct relation between uh, the uh, suppliers and the end users. Well, there is a uh, wheeling charge being paid to the uh, transmission operator and the distribution uh, operator. Um, uh, the 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 fourth scheme, which is uh, more, it is the sort of the hottest scheme, and uh, so far is the feed-in tariff scheme. It's a feed-in tariff scheme as well as a quota scheme, and as we heard earlier today, uh, the target is uh, around uh, 4,300 megawatts. 2,000 of them are uh, wind, and the remaining part are uh, solar, small and large size projects. Uh, the uh, feed-in tariff quota scheme uh, is uh, is uh, is described by that energy again is sold uh, to the transmission or distribu distribution utilities and then to the end users. Uh, over here, uh, the payment is according to the feed-in tariff uh, with a government guarantee. Uh, that feed-in tariff was calculated based on. Uh, uh, a 14% internal rate of return and uh, based on the developers will be pay, paying uh, taxes on their net revenues uh, up to 25%. Uh, uh, there is a connection charge which the developers are covering as well as uh, there is a, a land use charge of a 2% of the energy generated and uh, that's also being paid by them. Uh, uh, that scheme, uh, the end users uh, in this case will be subject and that's where the quota part scheme, the end user will be paying a tariff which reflects the real cost of the uh, uh, feed-in tariff scheme. Uh, so on one side, it's a fit and it's a, a relation between uh, the government utilities and the investors. On the other scheme, uh, on the other side, it's a quota scheme where uh, the end users will be paying for that. So in, in that sense, the government practically is not uh, paying any subsidies uh, for the uh, feed-in tariff program, uh, while the end users are really the ones who are going to pay the real cost. And that's one step towards liberalization of the electricity market, in addition to other steps uh, uh, also in the second part of year 2014, uh, electricity tariffs uh, were announced for the next five years, targeting uh, a zero subsidy uh, at the end of the five years. So uh, in one direction, the, the electricity tariffs for conventional, uh, for electricity from conventional resources uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, being tackled, uh, and that's based on a committed government uh, cost of fuel of $3 per million BTU. So the government is committed over the next five years uh, to provide uh, uh, fossil fuels at the $3. In addition to that, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the quota scheme for the feed-in tariff. Uh, uh, in, in this case, actually, so what the end users are paying is very much correlated to the value of the feed-in tariff. Um, uh, the estimated uh, uh, investments and capacities uh, for uh, for uh, uh, this uh, short, sort of five to seven years program in Egypt uh, is estimated to be over the ten thousand million dollars. Uh, between the different programs, between the projects which are conducted by the government, the New and Renewable Energy Authority, uh, the, B -B the BOO scheme, and the IPP and the feed-in tariff scheme. Uh, yet in Egypt, we are still working on uh, making sure that all these uh, schemes can coexist uh, together. Uh, we, we believe that at the end of the tunnel, uh, that the IPP scheme will prevail uh, because that's, that's 
uh, in a liberalized market, so uh, Egypt won't need uh, the subsidy schemes uh, like the FIT or the government uh, projects. So both uh, likely the IPP and the BOO schemes uh, will prevail. Uh, we're currently working on seeing that none of these programs fail. Uh, actually, we're working with some of the, I would say, uh, persistent developers. Some of them are here in this room, or one of them is here in this room, as a matter of fact, on providing uh, uh, mechanisms to get these, uh, uh, to get the IPP scheme uh, surviving uh, while competing with the other schemes. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, slide is showable. It shows that the, the current uh, feed-in scheme, uh, the, the different steps of it, uh, which we went through some of them actually so far uh, we went through uh, I'm not sure if there is a pointer here oops I switched the whole thing off okay well uh, uh, to the uh, upper uh, left corner uh, the feed-in tar tariff scheme started with the uh, qualification for the developers. Uh, that was uh, done uh, in November and December of last year. Uh, we have a large number of developers uh, which uh, exceeded the, uh, the successful ones, exceeded the 136 developers, uh, 100 in the solar area and 36 in the wind. Uh, the uh, um, that qualifications was based on uh, uh, financial uh, capabilities, management capabilities, as well as uh, some technical issues. Uh, the the second step, which most of the developers are uh, doing now, and I can see some of them also in this room, who are establishing the their SPV company, their uh, project company, uh, and. That uh, basically states that the qualified consortium needs to have 51% of the shares, uh, and and the lead uh, developer should have at least 25% uh, of the shares, and that should remain up till the commercial uh, uh, operation date. Uh, th that cannot change before two years. Uh, starting from the commercial operation date. That's more or less the stage which most of the developers are in now. Uh, the, the following step is the land allocation. The government of Egypt is providing uh, a number of schemes to uh, uh, facilitate the land for the projects. Some of them are primarily uh, from the government of Egypt through the new and renewable energy authority. Uh, uh, the land uh, will be uh, providing the land will be subject first to the uh, establishment of the SPV and then after that uh, there will be some guarantees uh, along the lifetime of the project. They start at 1% uh, LG, issuing an LG of 1% um, at the very start and then uh, going up to uh, two percent with the uh, during the implementation, and then when the commercial operation starts, uh, the uh, the LG go to 0.5 percent, and then after 10 years of operation, it's lowered then to 0.5. Per, uh, starts from 0.5 until the end of the lifetime of the project. Uh, so there is equal steps between the 0.5 and 2 percent uh, let LG uh, by the end of the. Uh, lifetime of the 25 years of the estimated uh, uh, lifetime of the solar projects and 20 years for the wind projects. Uh, and then uh, after that, the, the land returns uh, to the custody of the new and renewable energy authority. Uh, the land, uh, there is a number of permits uh, which are required. Uh, the which Nerea does provide these uh, uh, permits. But there is also uh, uh, there is a possibility of the developers having their own land, uh, either uh, being provided uh, from 
different governorates or, or private sector ownership uh, and in, in this case uh, the permits which include the uh, uh, no conflict of use of the land with the agriculture activities, with the petroleum uh, development activities, uh, or any heritage potential in Egypt. So that all uh, will be res the responsibility of the developer if he develops his project on his own land. Uh, then comes the activity of the uh, Egyptian Electricity Regulatory Agency uh, in providing uh, the interim license and my colleague uh, engineer uh, Salma Hussein will uh, be elaborating on that shortly in her presentation. I still have one or two minutes, Dr. Uh, uh, okay, uh, there is a number of other activities which will be going in parallel. Uh, I'll uh, just jump some of these uh, slides. Uh, you will have the details of them, but I'll just go back to that uh, starting slide where there is a number of agreements. Uh, there is the, a grid connection agreement with the transmission company and uh, uh, as well as a grid impact study. And that will be conducted by the developer in cooperation with the uh, transmission company, which is the main off-taker. Uh, there will be some uh, measurements as soon as the land is availed for the developers. Uh, these measurements will primarily constitute uh, the, an environment impact assessment, uh, and that will uh, be conducted and presented uh, and submitted to the, environment, the Egyptian Environmental uh, Authority. Um, there, is, there will be a use of fract agreement which is signed uh, with the new and renewable energy authority for the land which will be provided uh, by Norea. Uh, and there is uh, then the power purchase agreement which will be between the developer and uh, the uh, transmission company. Uh, uh, all of these agreements are developed. Uh, uh, they are they've been already uh, uh, discussed and the feedback from the international financing entities uh, were uh, taken into consideration, uh, but we do have an international consultant now who's looking on harmonizing all these uh, four primarily con contracts. The power purchase agreement contract, the grid connection contract, uh, there is a cost sharing agreement between the uh, developers and the transmission company and the new and renewable energy authority and then uh, the use of fract agreement. If all of this d is done, then uh, the, uh, the developer will go to a financial uh, closure uh, and that's where uh, we will have an official count and projects which reach their financial closure will be uh, 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 eligible for the announced feed in tariff. Uh, at the end, uh, the developers will apply for the, uh, uh, the permanent license again from uh, Egypt era, and again, engineer Selma will be uh, elaborating on that. I will jump my, the slides again here shortly, sorry for that. And okay, uh, just to uh, to, to tell you here, the potential, I mean, the land available in Egypt is huge. Uh, in addition to the for land for the 4,300 megawatts, uh, there is land for more than uh, 30 gigawatts of wind energy, and there is land for projects uh, of over 50 gigawatts of uh, uh, solar uh, energy. Uh, and, and actually what is uh, sort of controlling the development of the projects uh, and with the target of the 4300 uh, or the 4000 megawatts is actually the development of the transmission uh, utility. The government of Egypt have already uh, provided uh, 3 billion uh, Egyptian pounds uh, to strengthen the network in to be able to uh, 
deal with these uh, uh, large size projects, both the conventional and the renewable energy. Uh, having said that, and I just would like to end my presentation with saying that we cherished the sun 7,000 years ago, and we still do. So, uh, and hopefully we can all work together in doing that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Sopke. Thank you, uh, Professor Sopke, and I'm sure there will be many questions to clarify additional points. I would like to invite, uh, uh, before we jump to the question and discussions, probably Jini Selma can give us also the perspective of the regulators. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm short. Um, I would like to thank Chris for giving us such opportunity. I would like to thank all the audience for being part of our future. And I would like to thank Dr. Sobke for making my job easier. Um, I need to promise you that we as a regulator will be neutral and in the same space from all the stakeholders. As we promise ourselves, we will keep going on for a better future of sustainable energy in Egypt, working with all the utilities, entities, and all the stakeholders. It's worth you to say that we are, were working for long four years to be here talking about the fed-in tariff. We will keep working for our future we will keep working locally, regionally, and internationally. Today, I'm talking about our role, not apart from other utilities' role. We are going to work collaboratively towards your interests, our interests, and uh, the country interests. Thanks to the political will, our dream came true. Uh, I'm going to talk about our role regarding the law number two th 2003, which were clarified by somehow by Dr. Sopke, that states all the possible mechanisms to work with to develop and generate renewable energy to have such a sustainable energy mix. And those three mechanisms are in real, actually there are four, I didn't hit the merchant power plants, although we are having one uh, licensed uh, company working at the merchant power plants. So we are having INRIA, competitive bidding and fit and tariff, which is the hottest issue today. Uh, and that is kind of a comparison and a simple comparison of the size and the targeted uh, megawatts from each uh, mechanism. And of course, the off taker for all these uh, mechanisms are, is the grid. Uh, which uh, is committed, uh, uh, as said before, to, pay all, to purchase all the energy produced from them. As our role for NREA project is to determine the selling price based on the cost of service calculations, to approve all the contracts between, the, between NREA and uh, the electricity transmission company, and to license NREA, which is already licensed in 2003 and uh, still uh, renewing its license annually, and to work as uh, a mediator uh, to solve any dispute that could arise according to the contract obligations and rights. As for competitive bidding, we will approve the power purchase agreement and license the bidder winner and, of course, solve any dispute that could arise. For commercial-based projects, it's a longer list. We will approve the contracts, revise and approve the selling prices, since there is another consumer here, here than the grid, determine the wheeling charges, and license the project companies that will work on the commercial base. Then we will solve any dispute that will arise, hopefully not. 
The fitting tariff project. The fitting tariff design, as I told, it has been uh, accomplished and you are here because of that. Uh, we will grant the interim license and this is the short relationship between us and the investors which will be a permanent one after having a permanent license. Uh, and then we will approve the power purchase agreement which is sooner uh, will be uh, there and then you will have the permanent license. As Dr. Subki elaborated here, this is, these are all the steps that any investor above the 500 kilowatt will go through. It seems a lot, but it's a lot has been accomplished. Um, I would just give a look at our role here that we are going to uh, grant you the interim license we, where we made the process here easier and more simple since uh, everything is new and in the very beginning but that will not be the case after a while. Uh, and then we will approve the power purchase agreement and we will be uh, there for any dispute or any amendments that could occur in the future regarding this. And then we will issue the generation permanent license that will be granted for 25 years. So any of the investors who are here, we are having a very long relationship together, working annually on daily basis when you are having your permanent license. Looking forward to see you soon. The interim license process, this is uh, uploaded at our website. Unfortunately, we are having only the Arabic version, but I will make sure, uh, and we, Egypt Eri team, will make sure that you will have it in English and all the documents, as they are all there in Arabic, sooner they will be there in English. This, this is the process for obtaining an interim license. It's not that big difference from obtaining a permanent license. Uh, the only difference here is if you are having an interim license, uh, you will have to move less steps when you are going to obtain permanent ones. Uh, you will have to have the license application. First, you have to uh, uh, fulfill the minimum requirements, and the minimum requirements here is to be uh, a qualified SPV uh, with a capacity more than 500 kilowatt, and then you have to establish an SPV according to is the SPV conditions, which we are, we are going to go through sooner. Uh, those SBV conditions is now is part of our licensing conditions. And then you have to submit an MOU for the land from INRIA or privately owned land for the whole project life. That means the land has to be there for the 25 years of the project. And after fulfilling all these requirements, uh, you will have to make a presentation to our team to elaborate your vision and to give deeper look at your expectations, uh, elaborate discussions and brainstorming about uh, your expectations and our expectations and how this is going to work. Uh, usually that is interpreted to a public hearing if you are having a permanent license. After fulfilling all these requirements and having such presentation, uh, a memorandum will be submitted to the board of directors with the whole uh, vision of your company and your project, and then you will be granted the interim license if everything is fulfilled. Now, I, I would like to make it easier for you to understand how to establish an SBV uh, uh, an SBV under the conditions that were uh, declared by Egypt era. Uh, if I open the pointer, it will close. Okay, no, it's working here. So first of all, we, you have to know that each SBV is only having a 50 megawatt capacity. It's allowed only for 50 megawatt capacity. And uh, with an issued capital, 50 million LE, the team leader of the consortium will have a 25% uh, of the total share of the consortium. 
if the team leader is changed or any of the member is changed or getting out of the consortium for any reason, this the, the replaced one or the consortium has to be qualified again from the fit-in tariff unit. But if new members are joining the consortium, they have to fulfill only this, this condition, to have 51% of the total share, while the new members will have 49% of the total share. But in all cases, after the commercial operation, any change of this structure has to be notified to the Egyptian regulator. Another thing under the conditions is, as I mentioned before, the SBV capacity will be 50 megawatt, but that is not the restriction for the members of each consortium. So the members of any consortium could have a 100 megawatt of each technology, either wind or solar, in any site. And the site here is defined by